People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on nutrition, health, and medicine. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast. It is May, spring is in the air, and I'm happy to say that this is our 12th episode on the People Scientist Podcast. Thank you to my People Scientist Army for tuning in every week, and especially thank you to those of you who have written me reviews or left me comments or asked questions on my social media. Hearing that someone learned a lot from an episode is really what makes doing this podcast every week worth it for me. On my very first episode, I said my goal is no matter anyone's educational background, I want all of you to say at the end of each of my episodes, hmm, I learned something new. And if you've learned something new, then my job has been successful. So with that being said, I hope you all learned something new on today's episode, and that is the topic of phytosterols. Now, I mentioned phytosterols briefly in last week's episode when we talked about cholesterol and heart disease, but I thought that phytosterols are so interesting that they deserve an episode to themselves. So let's get right into it. So to start off with our new episode format, here is my core takeaway. Phytosterols are a plant's version of cholesterol. So when we eat phytosterols, they compete with cholesterol for absorption into our body. As a result, eating phytosterols can lower LDL cholesterol in many people. Phytosterols can also reduce levels of oxidized LDL which, as I discussed last week, is really the culprit in heart disease. As a result, it is recommended to consume phytosterols as the first line of defense to lower cholesterol. This recommendation was made by the NCEP. High sources of phytosterols include avocados, nuts, and plant oil, such as coconut oil, olive oil, and flax oil. Just remember not to heat flax oil, but to buy it cold-pressed and keep it in the fridge. So now, let's get into the details. Phytosterols are present in a wide variety of plants and essentially are a plant's version of cholesterol. The function of phytosterols in plants is to form the cell membrane structure of a plant, similar to what cholesterol does in our bodies. Now, the reason I bring up phytosterols to everyone today is because there have been hundreds of clinical trials conducted looking at the health effects of phytosterols, particularly on their ability to lower LDL cholesterol which is popularly termed as our bad cholesterol. The cholesterol-lowering ability of phytosterols was first demonstrated in humans back in 1953, where scientists gave individuals a mix of phytosterols suspended in oil, and it was later marketed under the name Citalin for the treatment of elevated cholesterol until the early 1980s. Phytosterols during this time were working in some individuals, but the results were variable. Then with the onset of statins, and their ability to lower cholesterol more reliably, the idea of phytosterols as cholesterol-lowering compounds fell by the wayside. But in the last 15 years, with the eruption of functional foods and nutraceuticals, scientists started to investigate phytosterols again. The biggest landmark clinical trial was published by Mietinen in 1995 in the New England Journal of Medicine where 153 people with high cholesterol were asked to add margarine supplemented with phytosterols or just regular margarine to their diet every day for one year. After one year, the reduction in LDL cholesterol was 10.2% in the phytosterol group, whereas in the control group, LDL did not change, with only an increase of 0.1% over one year. When the participants stopped taking the phytosterol margarine, their cholesterol started to rise after two months. RAS in 2014 in the British Journal of Nutrition pulled together 124 clinical trials that investigated phytosterols and cholesterol levels. Now, phytosterols naturally exist in many foods, but these clinical trials extracted the phytosterols and added them to a variety of foods. Now, the studies included phytosterol supplementation from 0.2 up to 9 grams per day. The investigators would provide the phytosterols within a food such as yogurt, 
milk, baked foods, margarine spreads, or juice. The authors noted that phytosterol intakes of 0.6 to 3.3 grams per day significantly reduced LDL cholesterol by on average 6 to 12 percent. The LDL low cholesterol lowering effect of phytosterols continued to increase up to intakes of approximately 3 grams per day to an average effect of 12 percent reduction in LDL cholesterol. A meta-analysis by Abumwise analyzed whether the type of food the phytosterols were supplemented into would alter their ability to lower cholesterol. They concluded that phytosterols incorporated into fat spreads, mayonnaise, salad dressing, or dairy reduced LDL levels to a greater extent than when they were incorporated into products such as baked goods and juices. We may also find phytosterols in capsule form. Fewer studies have been conducted on phytosterols in pill form, but they also report reductions in LDL cholesterol by on average 0.15 to 0.68 millimoles per liter across the different clinical trials. Ferretti in 2010 further showed that phytosterols could prevent lipid peroxidation of human cholesterol, which is really key and important. Avram in 1993 illustrated that cytoserol, a type of phytosterol, inhibited LDL oxidation by up to 26% in human cholesterol and blood. If you recall from the last two episodes, lipid peroxidation leads to inflammation and clogging of the arteries called atherosclerosis. So if we can prevent this, that is a good thing in lowering the risk of heart disease. Further, Liang in the journal Atherosclerosis in 2011 showed in an animal study that phytosterols in the diet may help maintain healthy blood vessel function. Many other animal studies also show that phytosterols can prevent atherosclerotic plaque development, otherwise called clogged arteries. This topic was reviewed very well by Othman and Mogadajan in the journal Nutrition Reviews. But again, keep in mind that these particular results were limited to animal studies. But how do phytosterols reduce LDL cholesterol and have a beneficial effect on blood vessels? Well, due to the fact that cholesterol and phytosterols have very similar chemical structures, phytosterols are able to compete with cholesterol for absorption in the gut. Phytosterols essentially prevent cholesterol from being incorporated into our intestinal micelles, and as a result, cholesterol is excreted from the body rather than absorbed. The absorption of bile acids, which also contain cholesterol, is also reduced in the presence of phytosterols. So you may be wondering if someone does not eat a lot of cholesterol, for example, eats more of a plant-based diet that doesn't contain cholesterol, will phytosterols have an effect? Well, it has been previously shown that phytosterol supplementation can reduce LDL cholesterol when supplemented while consuming a low cholesterol diet. So phytosterols may lower LDL cholesterol through other ways besides inhibiting cholesterol absorption. As a result of the large amount of clinical data, the National Cholesterol Education Program now encourages the use of plant sterols as therapeutic dietary options before resorting to drug treatment in order to lower blood cholesterol levels. Phytosterols have also been investigated for their ability to impact inflammation and the immune system. Overall, I would say that the data is very conflicting. About half the studies show an improvement and half show no improvement or very slight worsening. Overall, Rocha in the journal Atherosclerosis in the year 2016 conducted a meta-analysis that pulled together 20 randomized controlled trials that looked at phytosterols and inflammation. They concluded that overall adding plant phytosterols to the diet did not significantly change markers of inflammation such as C-reactive protein. So I think we still need a lot more data to understand who may benefit from the plant phytosterols in lowering inflammation and who may not. In recent years, a lot of interest has been directed toward plant sterols in the protection from cancer. Rick et al. suggested that dietary phytosterols may offer protection from colon cancer. The scientists examined the growth of tumors in rats that were fed a 0.2% phytosterol-containing diet for 28 weeks. There was a 39% reduction in the number of rats that developed the tumor with phytosterols in the diet. 
and a 60% reduction in the number of tumors per rat when they ate phytosterols. AWOD in the year 2000 reviewed very nicely the results that in cell culture, many cancer cells slow their growth in the presence of phytosterols. In The Lancet in 1999, Burgess reported that in 200 men living with benign prostate hyperplasia, or in other words called an enlarged prostate, the 20 milligrams of a phytosterol supplement significantly improved symptoms and urinary flow parameters in these men without altering prostate size. The hypothesized mechanisms of phytosterols against cancer are that phytosterols can induce programmed cell death called apoptosis in cancer cells, or they can change the cell membrane composition. Overall, I would say that the data to support that phytosterols can reduce the risk of cancer is still very preliminary, but very promising. So is there a downside to phytosterols? Animal and human experiments have not reported any serious side effects with the consumption of phytosterols at low doses. There's a very slight concern that phytosterols may very slightly reduce the levels of vitamin E and beta carotene. But luckily, some of the sources of phytosterols, such as nuts and vegetables, also happen to be a good source of vitamin E and beta carotene. So if we add good sources of vitamin E and beta carotene at the same time, this should counteract the slight reduction in these levels with phytosterols. In addition, there is a very small subset of the population that has what we call familial hypercholesterolemia. In other words, people that have a genetic disorder that causes them to have extremely high levels of cholesterol starting from even a very young age. Unfortunately, people with this condition need to be on cholesterol medications in order to reduce their risk of heart disease and cardiovascular events. People with this condition will also have phytosterolemia, meaning they absorb phytosterols at a rate much higher than everyone else. The effect of this high absorption of phytosterols in people with familial hypercholesterolemia are unknown. Okay, so phytosterols may have some health benefits. So if we want to include them into our diet, how can we do that? Well, in the United States, Europe, and Australia, there are foods such as spreads and plant milks that are fortified with phytosterols, and these have been studied extensively to show benefit in reducing cholesterol. There are supplements that exist in pill form that also make it easier to get around that two grams of phytosterols per day. But I am wary of supplements as supplements are not regulated strictly like foods and drugs are. Meaning sometimes supplements may contain compounds that are not listed on the label or the compounds may degrade into other compounds of which we don't know the health effect. So if you want to try a phytosterol supplement, I would suggest talking to your physician first. But instead of taking supplements, we can eat those foods that are fortified with phytosterols or foods that are naturally rich in phytosterols. Lynn and colleagues in 2010 reported that phytosterols naturally present in foods are effective in decreasing cholesterol absorption and can help eliminate cholesterol from our body. So we may not necessarily need to look for phytosterol supplements, but can simply add phytosterol rich foods to our diet. Now in our typical Western diet, we usually consume anywhere from 80 to 300 milligrams of phytosterols per day, depending on your diet. And vegetarians are known to consume upward of 700 milligrams of phytosterols per day. Perhaps this is another mechanism by which plant-based diets are associated with lower risks of heart disease and cancer, as I had discussed previously on our plant-based diet episode. As I mentioned in last week's episode, one of the highest sources of phytosterols is avocados. One really well-designed clinical trial was published by Wang in the Journal of the American Heart Association, and they had conducted a randomized crossover controlled clinical trial in 45 overweight or, or obese participants with high LDL cholesterol levels. Now, they had looked at three different types of diets in these participants, and they rotated through each diet for five weeks. The first diet was a lower-fat diet, the second diet was a moderate fat diet that contained one fresh Hass avocado every day. And the third diet was a moderate fat diet that had the same amount of monounsaturated fatty acids as the avocado, but did not contain any avocado. 
Compared with the baseline, the reduction in LDL cholesterol was highest with the avocado diet. They saw on average a reduction in LDL cholesterol by 14.6 milligrams per deciliter. Furthermore, only the avocado diet had shown a significant reduction in the number of LDL particles and also significantly reduced those small, dense LDL cholesterol levels, as well as improving the LDL to HDL ratio. Now, this is really key. So if you remember from last week, the small dense LDL and the ratio of HDL to LDL are very important measures in our risk of heart disease. So it appears that having, adding one avocado per day to your diet can be very heart healthy. Now, there could be a lot of healthful components within avocados to have established such a beneficial effect, but it is possible that the high phytosterol content certainly contributed. Phytosterols are also very abundant in vegetable oils. For example, rice bran oil, which I personally have never heard of before, has the highest amount of phytosterols measured at almost 1,200 milligrams per 100 grams of oil. Other vegetable oils that are high in phytosterols include coconut oil, sesame oil, olive oil, almond oil, and many others. But just as in a couple weeks back, make sure not to heat vegetable oils if they contain unsaturated fatty acids. Cold pressed oil, if it is an option, will be less likely to have lipid peroxides as the manufacturers did not use heat to extract the oil. Now coconut oil, as I said before, is a safe oil to heat, but other oils high in unsaturated fatty acids when heated can produce lipid peroxides, which can increase the risk of cell damage, heart disease, and cancer. So if using these oils, make sure to add them to your dish after cooking or on top of cold dishes or in smoothies, for example. Nuts and seeds are also an excellent source of phytosterols, including cashews, walnuts, pistachios, sesame seeds, flax seeds, and almonds. Now remember, although nuts, seeds, and oils can be healthy, they are also high in calories. So remember to keep this in mind, and perhaps you'll need to cut something out of your diet in order to compensate for the extra calories you may be getting you are adding these foods to your diet. Whole grains, bran, and fruits and vegetables in general are also a great source of phytosterols. Now I found some of the information on phytosterol levels on this database from the USDA. And if you are like me and you love research about foods and nutrition, and you wanna check out the phytosterol content of several foods in our food market, I'll make sure to link the website below. I, for example, on this website typed in phytosterols and it gave me a list of the foods and their phytosterol content. And you can do this for other nutrients beside phytosterols as well. Now this list is, list is not perfect. It does not contain all foods. For example, it didn't contain avocados and flaxseed in the phytosterol list, but it is a good place to start if you are interested and want to check it out. So that is a wrap on this week's episode of the People Scientist podcast. In brief summary, phytosterols are like a plant's version of cholesterol. When we eat phytosterols, they compete with cholesterol for absorption in our body. Across many different clinical trials, phytosterols reduce LDL cholesterol and oxidation of LDL, which is really the culprit of heart disease. The average intake of phytosterols in these trials was about 2 grams per day. Phytosterols may hold promise for reducing cancer risk and inflammation, but the data so far is preliminary. Phytosterols are abundant in the fat content of plants, and good sources of phytosterols include bran oil, avocados, coconut oil, olive oil, sesame seeds, flax seeds, pistachios, almonds, walnuts, and in general, fruits and vegetables. I hope that some more interesting data comes out on phytosterols in the near future. If it does, you can bet that I will make sure to update all of you. All right, my people scientist army, I have armed you with the scientific evidence on phytosterols. It is now up to you to do with this information what you will. I hope you all have a super healthy week and I will meet you back here the same time, the same place on the People Scientist podcast. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. 
My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates.